Good morning, Dunamis uh, Life Church, both our local and our online campus. Uh, welcome again to Pentecost 2020. I come to recognize that when God sets aside a particular festival or commemoration and celebration for his people in the calendar that recurs from one season to the next, that there's a significance to that. And with that significance is also a blessing that's embedded. And so today we recognize that 2020 has been a year unlike any other. It is the beginning of a new decade. And I still believe despite all that has gone on um, this week and um, in recent times in this difficult time, that God is still at work. And I want to make sure that we're there, we're joining him as a church, that we don't miss the moment of his Holy Spirit, we don't miss the move of the Holy Spirit, because it is he is still moving in the earth. And so today, join me in Acts um, chapter 2. We're going to look at a foundational text, and then we're going to begin to unpack um, the purpose and significance and power of the Pentecost celebration. So Acts chapter 2, you're going to need your uh, Bible, where we're actually working on getting the scriptures up on the screen. But I trust that you have your phone, you have your Bible. Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each of them. And verse 4 says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. And verse 5 says, Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and was bewildered because each of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Gal um, Galilean? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? And if we go down to verse, um, verse 12, and it says, And they all continue to be in amazement and great perplexity, uh, saying to one another, What does this mean? What others were mocking and saying they are, that they are full of sweet wine. But Peter, in verse 14, says, Taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, <clears throat> Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to the words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose. For it is only the third hour of the day, but this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And the, and the prophecy says, and it shall be in the last days, God says that I will pour out my, for my spirit on all of mankind. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and young men shall see visions and old men shall dream dreams. And so this is the word for us on today. And so Pentecost designates the 50th day after Passover, which is a, a feast. It is the known feast of weeks or a feast of harvest or first fruits. And so from the very first Passover, um, the children of Israel and the Jewish people celebrated, um, uh, pass, uh, the celebrated Pentecost. Um, and it was a ark ark uh, agricultural or a feast of harvest that they celebrated. But here in the book of Acts, uh, the Holy Spirit poured out upon 120 believers. When you look in the first chapter of Acts, it talked about they were in the upper room. There was 120 people and they were there. The scripture says that they were on one accord and they began to pray because God instructed them to go to Jerusalem and to be empowered. And actually, in the, the John, the Gospel of John, starting around um, after uh, verse uh, chapter 16 onward, he begins to give them this farewell um, speech, if you will, or this, 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 this conversations that he began to have with his disciples with regard to him leaving and him replacing himself with the promise of his spirit. And so today, we want to understand the, the, the purpose and power of Pentecost. The, the purpose of it and the power and the significance of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer and the church. And sometimes it often seems that the individual believer in the church somehow gets stranded between Calvary and Pentecost. And what I mean by that is that Calvary is where um, 
we look at, let's even go before Calvary, in Bethlehem, right, there's certain things that we celebrate, Christmas, the resurrection, right, which is Calvary, but when we look at the birth of Christ and look at Bethlehem, Bethlehem signifies that God is with us, that his promise of sending his son to him, God incarnated, God is with us. In Calvary, which we celebrate um, during the resurrection season, it signifies God for us. Why? Because it pardoned our sin. It reconciled us. It, it justified us when he was the perfect slam, lamb that was slain. He was the Passover lamb for us, right? And so now today on Pentecost, it signifies for us that God is in us. It means the power of God is available to us, the anointing. The anointing is the supernatural ability and strength of God. For what reason? To, to um, accomplish his work and his assignment of the church in the earth. But watch this. Even on the day, the, the uh, Pentecost that we saw in the book of Acts, the significance of the outpouring of the Spirit, it was one for them to be a witness and one for them to evangelize. And the miracle of Acts is the fact that when they began to speak with other tongues, if we understand um, the scripture in the Bible, we recognize in um, the Tower of Babel, that story that told how when man became on one accord that they were going to build a tower to heaven, that God divided their language or divided their tongue such mm -hmm. that they spoke different language. And here we see, watch this, that God begins to unify us, the diverse. When you look at that um, text, the part we didn't read over, all of the, it came from all over. It's from Libya, from um, all over in the regions. In that um, chapter 2, verses um, 5 through 12, it talks about there was a great multitude, a huge amount of people there from different nationalities, ethnicities. But this outpouring of the Holy Spirit unified them in the midst of their diversity. And so we see the significance that where God had previously divided the tongue, but even though they spoke in tongue and it said that every man heard their native language being spoken on the tongue that was set like fire upon the Galileans that as they exited the upper room. And so we see in this text that God begins to unify us even in the midst of our diversity. And we need that on today. We need that even in this season because the enemy is trying to divide the anointing and the unification and the one accord in the earth among the body of believers. And so we have to begin to contend for the faith and what God, we need to contend for justice. We need to contend that we are like Christ, right? Amen. Amen. And, and so this is a thing. So God in Bethlehem recognizes that he is with us. Calvary said that he is for us. And Pentecost is that he is in us. Somebody say in us. And so I don't know about you, but I want to be set on fire. I want to be set ablaze. I want to be refined in the fire of the Holy Spirit on today. I want God to eliminate and to burn away everything that is not like him. I want him to take away everything that my flesh would want to cause that will cause itself to wrestle against the spirit fully being filled, fully having the manifestation and the power of God in my life. And, and, and so what's interesting for us, Dunamis Life, and I'm not trying to exclude all of you that are jumping on, but for us, the, the name of our church, the birth of our ministry, Dunamis Life, is rooted in Acts 1 and 8. It's rooted in um, the significance of the Greek word dunamis that means to receive power. And so Acts 1 and 8, it says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be a witness God is looking for us to be a witness. He's looking for us to bear fruit, right? He's looking for us to be an example in our testimony would be a witness to the world that the church and the believers or us as Christians, that we will be witness to the world and bear witness of Christ Jesus, of the love of God. And so when we are divided on the earth, God cannot have his way. His will in heaven cannot make be done here in the earth. And he said he needed us to be a witness in our city, in our state, and even in our country to every remote part of the world. He wants his body of Christ to bear witness. And so if you can also turn with me, I want to give you, so Acts 1 and 8, it means dunamis power. That word power means dunamis. It means to be empowered, right? Also Ephesians 6.10. Can you turn there with me? I just want to lay a foundation, and then we're going to unpack a couple of things here. 
for the significance. Because you, if you're like me, a lot of times when I was growing up, what is, the, what is the historical significance of the Bible? So we get the understanding of what Passover meant. 50 days after um, Passover, we had Pentecost. But what does that mean for us today? There's still significance for what God has set in place for us. And we don't want to miss this season of the outpouring of God's Spirit. We don't want to miss it in the midst of us, um, even as we're beginning to um, reopen, we're able to get more, we're able to do more things, we're able to leave our houses more. We don't want to get distracted by everyday life that we miss what God is doing in the Spirit. And so in Ephesians 6.10, watch this, Paul says, finally be strong, finally my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And so we see the word strong, we see the word strength, and we see his might. All of those are different uh, Greek words that has some implication of to be powered and empowered, to be in, infused with power. And so dunamis, one, Acts 1 and 8, it means it's where we get the word dynamite to be explosive. It talks about the ability and the power. And so as, as Christ told his disciples in John, he says, I'm not going to leave you without a helper, right? And so in Ephesians, um, we're looking here that God has designed us to be his vessels, to be his carriers of his divine power. And so the difference between the birth of the New Testament church in Acts, the presence of God was, was, was there from the beginning. Genesis 1 and 2 says that the spirit of the Lord hovered over the earth. Even before God began to form it fully, it said the spirit of God, Genesis 1-2, it said the spirit of the Lord um, hovered over the earth. And so the spirit of God has always been moving in the earth. But we see in Acts when the birth of the church, the New Testament church, the new covenant, that God um, infused us with his spirit. We became the vessels that we became the containers of his spirit. And so he desires that we be infused with supernatural strength and ability. And you may not fully understand why, but I'm going to tell you in a second. He desires that we will be empowered with the strength of God. He desires that we receive this inner strength. Um, why is that? Because without the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit operating in us, somebody say operating in me, none of us can ever win this battle against Satan. We can never be successful against his schemes and his tactics. And we see humanity begin to fail when we're not submitted to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Humanity's failed. We are a poor steward of the earth. We are a poor steward of our assignment. We are a poor steward of our relationship with one another when the Spirit of God is not overflowing, when we're not filled with the Spirit and bearing fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, right? Long-suffering. And so it's important, watch this, Ephesians 6, if we look at that verse 12, it says this. So, so Paul in verse 10, it says, I need you to be strong in the Lord and in his strength and in his might. Why is that? Because in verse 12, he gives us the reason. He says, for our, our struggle, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's manifested in our humanity for sure. The enemy is behind the scene. But he says, our enemy is not flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the powers, against the principalities, the forces of darkness, against the forces of wickedness that is operating, that causes us not to see each other as our brothers and our sisters. And so we have to understand that, our, that you are not my enemy. And I don't know if you're sitting with someone, sometimes I don't know if the enemy has gotten in the midst of your family, sometimes in your household. You have to look at your loved one, you have to look at your child, look at your spouse, and say, I'm not your enemy. But our enemy is in principalities, is in dark places. Somebody just type, you are not my enemy. We need to say that to one another right now, right? The black man is not your enemy. The white man is not your enemy. Police officers are not our enemy. It is the failure of humanity, of, of, of a heart that hasn't, watched this, been reconciled in Calvary. That is our enemy. And so we, we want to be able to, to, to unify together. In Dunamis Life, we are 
um, by assignment, by God's chosen. We have, we have the honor and God has given us the favor in our assignment to be intergenerational, right? To be multicultural, to, to, um, to have a diversity of expression. Because imagine this, it, it, it's <laughs> we, a multicultural, intergenerational in an urban context. <laughs> We are not fully expressing the body of Christ when we operate in exclusion and superiority. We're not fully representing the heart of God and the expression of who God is when we operate in what divides us versus what unifies us. And so I believe God wants to pour out his spirit, not just in earth, but he wants, he wants dunamis life to represent the very empowerment to break yokes, to destroy strongholds, to be able to set people free. And I believe that's what God wants us to do and that he's equipping us. He's given us the supernatural, not in our own strength. Because if I allow myself to be led in my flesh, to be led by anger, to be led by rage, we don't have what was exhibited even on yesterday when we had a peace march in Camden where it was a unified front between pastors, clergy, the mayor, Congress, um, um, Congress people. We elected officials at all levels and the police department giving cadence at the same time in community. That is not going to be, it's not going to make national news, but trust me that God is doing something in our city and he's doing something in your individual life and he's doing something in our church. And so we don't want to relinquish our unique identity in this. Somebody say dunamis, just drop it in the, in the comments, just help me out. Somebody say dunamis power to overcome, to be what? More than a conqueror. And so we got, need to recognize who is our enemy and, and, and actually, we also need to begin to dismantle some things. And we can only do that if we begin to speak um, truth and authentic pursuit of God and have an authentic pursuit of relationship with one another. He says, this that men will know, meaning the world will know that you are my disciples, if what you love one another, the power of love. The power of being in agreement. The power of being on one accord. It doesn't matter if you speak another language. It doesn't matter your nationality. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. But when Christ unifies us, when we are unified in the blood of Christ and the reconciliation power, there is nothing that the enemy can cause that will defeat us. And so it's important that God wants us on, on this Pentecost. We recognize that he is still working in the earth. But he needs the fruit of what he represents, his son represents, to be manifested in us as the church and as a believer. And so we need to dismantle some systemic things in our society. We need to begin to dismantle. And it begins with breaking the silence. It begins with breaking the silence, coming off the sidelines and begin to stand on, um, with one another with regard to truth. And so the devil is trying to divide. He's trying to divide the anointing. Because when we are unified, we have laser focus, laser pride. We have an intensified, a collaborative, a collective anointing. So when the intercessors, watch this, are, are interceding for us as, as we're coming together, as we're trying to win our community, as we're trying to overcome addiction, as we are trying to overcome abuse, as we're trying to overcome poverty, all of these things are in our assignment. And as the intercessors are providing air coverage, while we are front line on the ground, touching lives, praying and interceding. This, 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 the realm of what the enemy is setting up, he doesn't want us to succeed. He doesn't want love to overcome hate. He doesn't want to see everyone working together. He wants to pent and divide us, but God wants to unify us. He wants to do the same miracle that he did in Acts, he wants to do in the midst of us today. Is anybody willing to contend for the faith? Is anyone willing to, to allow the Holy Spirit to overflow in their life that you can begin to pray and dismantle? You can begin to tear down things with the truth of the word of God in your co-worker's life, on campuses, 
as, as things begin to open up, as our kids be going back to school, we can put the truth and the word of truth in our children's mouths that they can even at day camp begin to win others for Christ, when they can discern when, someone, when another child or another student is unhappy, that they can begin to pray and say a prayer of encouragement that gives life and reconcile. That is what God wants to do. He wants to pour out his spirit. And so, beloved, our enemy is not you and I. So we need to stop the fighting. We need to stop the killing of one another. We need to pull for one another. We need to support one another. We need to believe in one another. We need to care for one another. We need to pray for one another. Because God wants to move. We, he wants us to be bold like Peter was. It's like, no, take a second look. And see, that's the thing. The enemy wants you to take a quick glance and to begin to use uh, sometimes the filter of our judgment to quickly judge a circumstance and a situation. But Peter said, no, they're not drunk, as you may have seen. They're not guilty, as they may look. And so we, 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 we need God to give us to be able to look deeper into some of our issues. We, he, we, he needs to begin to cause us to a, a wailing and a repentance. And that's all of us. That's not even putting any one person out. That's all of us. All of us have a reason. We all have had our biases. Let's be honest. We've all had biases. We've all had prejudice. We actually, even in, in our own households, we still got some stubborn natures where we, where we still can't seem to get along because why? We're listening with hurt ears and responding out of hurt hearts. But God wants to heal us. He wants to heal our land. And so our only hope of reinforcing, watch this, the victory that, that Christ had and to demonstrate that the enemy is still defeated. Is he still defeated in your life? is by receiving the help of the Holy Spirit. And so we need God, we need a new release of God's power within us, right? And that power is inaccessible to us, watch this. So the scripture says that the Holy Spirit came like fire. And so the Holy Spirit is often represented as wind, pneuma, as, as, as fire. And, and so um, that same power that raised Christ from the dead on Calvary, that resurrected him, the same power that worked the miracle where um, Galileans can speak in other tongues and, and, um, and others can recognize that the gospel can get through and they were amazed and dumbfounded because they couldn't wrap their head around it. They were speaking fluently in other tongues and other languages. That same power is available to us. The breath of God is available to us. And this week, I've been trying to catch my breath <laughs> because I've been grieving and been lamenting and, and been overwhelmed and, and disheartened. But, but, but I said, God, I can't breathe. I need to catch my I need you to breathe in me yet again. And so where Corona is trying to suffocate and take our breath by, by attacking our respiratory system, the disruption that is happening, the, 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 the um, other cultural pandemic that is happening in our nation right now. The world is watching. And we're having, we're having to navigate multiple pandemics, economic, health, and cultural, all at the same time. My God. And so the enemy is trying to suck the very breath out of us. But we are more than a conqueror. That God is going to breathe in us fresh. There is a fresh awakening. There is a fresh renewal in the spirit that is going to unify us, put us on one accord. Because he says in John, watch this, John 14 and 16, I'll read it for you. He says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper, another comforter. And so the thing that's manifested, and even the prophecy that is yet being filled, just like the prophet that Joel spoke, that Peter said, no, they're not drunk, but this is a fulfillment of prophecy. We know that God honors his word. What he has spoken is going to come to pass, beloved. And so we're going to hold true that God is not a man that he should lie. He's not even the son of man that he needs to repent. But whatever he says that he's going to do, he's going to do. He is, he's, he's going to honor his word. And he's going to honor his spirit. And so he says, I'm going to send you a helper 
that may be with you, what, forever. That it is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. Do you know him today? I don't know what things that need to be conquered. I don't know what things that you need to break free from, things that you need to break out in the spirit, but you won't be able to do it unless you know him, unless his spirit overflows in him, unless you allow him to just set you a fire, set you a flame. But he says, because he abides with you and he will be in you. That's John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17. And so watch this. We see him. So what does that tell us? It tells us, so the word paraclete, it, it, it simply means, it, it says he's a comforter, he's a counselor. He is what? An advocate. Someone that comes alongside, someone who strengthens and someone who fights on your behalf. And we talked about that previously, that him being a counselor and he's interceding on our behalf. So, he, so he's a paraclete, right? And so watch this. This I need you to turn with. This is going to be our last, our last scripture here. I know we've had great worship. We, our, we, our worship went a little bit longer, but we wanted to set the atmosphere. Amen. So Isaiah 11 and 2. Turn here with me. Because we need to understand not just the power that is available to us, the purpose that God has for us, but we need to understand the function of the Holy Spirit in our life. So he is a comforter, he is a counselor, he is an advocate. And watch this. This is why you can't afford not to have him operate in any life. You can't, can't afford not to be fully submitted to the flow of the Spirit in your life. And watch your worship is what ushers in the presence of the Lord, the fullness of the presence of God in your life. Isaiah 11.2, are you there? Isaiah 11.2. And, and, and then we're, we're, we're going to pray. It says, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, meaning Christ. It says, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. We need God's wisdom. We need God's understanding. And then it says, the spirit of counsel and strength. The spirit of knowledge and the spirit and the fear of the Lord. And so that, that's the Holy Spirit. The, spirit. the Holy Spirit, he is a spirit of wisdom, of understanding, of counsel of strength, of knowledge, all of which you need right now for your life, all of which you need right now to understand how do I get from here from where I am now and here to there? How do I navigate the gap between what I, where I am and what I believe? It is not by my own strength. It's not by my own understanding, but it's by his spirit that God said in, in, in Zechariah. He said, it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. And so we truly need God to lead us in this time. And, and Dunamis Life, I, 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 am, I am proud of us. I am godly proud of us. And I am rooting for us. I am determined that we will not be devastated in this season and that no one is going to be left behind. So I don't care if you've connected with us in some way, covenant and fellowship. Just consider yourself our online campus or whatever. But you are a part of us. And we are connected together. We are stronger together. We are better together. And anytime the enemy is going to look to divide us, know that it is a scheme. It is a strategy and tactic to dilute the power of God in your life, in your house, and among us as a church. And so we have control over our assignment. We're praying for the rest of the body of Christ, universal, the intercessors, the prophets are praying and interceding. But we want to be on our assignment. We want to be an example of love. We want to be an example of reconciliation. We want to be an example of repentance. We want to be an example of dismantling things and unifying a community that, and, and a city that no one else thinks that, that it is possible. But we are rising. And God wants to awaken us even more to his spirit. And so I'm asking you now to begin to, to, to prepare. We're going to pray. I want you to prepare your heart. And if the Spirit of God has already been speaking with you, I just simply want you to surrender to him. I want you, as, as, as the, um, the mothers used to tell us, just get a yes on your heart. Just to get a, 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 a posture of surrender. Get a posture. If, if there's something 
that um, we need to uh, repent from. We need to be real with God. We need to be authentic with God. And so we want to, I want to begin to pray for us right now in this moment. And so, Father, I thank you right now. You have made a way. You have made it possible. And we ask right now that you would begin to rest your spirit in every household, in every space that, that our church occupies. We recognize that we don't have to be geographically, physically in the same place in order to be on one accord and to touch and agree. Overflow your, your spirit in us right now, Father. God, we thank you for the power that you've already demonstrated. We thank you for the favor in our assignment. We, we thank you, God, for the unity of our faith, the fellowship among our brothers and our sisters. We thank you for the preservation of your word and your blood right now in the name of Jesus. And so God, we consecrate ourselves as a church, as an example and as a demonstration of what we can overcome and what we can do better together. And Father, we ask right now that your will be done, that we recognize that your grace is for every race, that all of mankind was reconciled on Calvary, that was pardoned on Calvary, and Father, we ask now that we all will begin to rise up and take accountability to be authentic, to speak truth to power, that we will connect and encourage one another, and that we won't stand on the sideline as innocent lives are taking place. And Father, I ask right now in the name of Jesus that you begin to cause us to build up and not to tear down our lives, our homes, whether that's through addiction, through drugs, through rioting. But God, we, you want us to build up and not to tear down. And so, God, we're on the walls of our city. We're on the walls of our home. We're on the walls, God, with a weapon in one hand and a tool in the other. And all that simply means we're interceding and we're praying. We're building at the same time that we're fortifying our homes, our cities, and our lives. Because the enemy is seeking who he can still kill and destroy. But, God, you defeated him on Calvary and you defeated the power of the grave. And so we pray right now for every grieving mother, for every grieving family, anyone who's grieving any and every type of loss right now. But God, our country is in devastation. But we believe that your power is going to cause us to rise again. And God, Dunamis Life wants to not just bear the name of power. We want to be the witness and bear witness of your power in our lives, not for our own glory but God, for your name's sake and for your glory. And so we thank you right now. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Beloved, I want you to continue to be encouraged and, and, and be strengthened. And I'm, 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 I'm expecting the testimonies of the overflow of God begin to overflow in us. So let's continue to connect in prayer, connect in his word. Let's do life together. Um, beloved, in Deuteronomy's life, God is going to just really show himself strong. He's going to show forth his glory in every area of our life. Be blessed.